And I'm Alejandro is a um, assistant professor and world language program coordinator um, at the University of Maryland. Um, he also did his graduate work here at the University of Iowa um, in the Department of Ed. Um, his research focuses on equity and inclusivity in bilingual education and in teacher education training. Um, and then we have Gabriela uh, Olivares, who serves as the Associate Dean of the Graduate College at the University of Northern Iowa and oversees graduate program compliance, admission processes, student success, and social media marketing. Um, and has also worked, it works in the Spanish department, um, used to be the director of uh, the Spanish language instruction there. Uh, and so they're going to be talking to us for our final presentation for the day. You tell me when to start. Um, we just need to get. I can't highlight um, him until he turns on his video. So. Okay, his video is on now. So we should be able to spotlight him. Perfect. I hope you can see me. So would you like me to share the, the video from my computer? Not the video, the PowerPoint. Sure, why don't you? That might make it a little bit easier. Yeah, I think that will be easier. I'll have here too, so. All right. Alejandro, I'm going to get going. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm Gabi Olivares, and thank you for the presentation. And I'm here with my colleague, Alejandro. And we're going to uh, talk about some um, research information about OER. I will let my colleague Alejandro introduce himself and get started. Alejandro is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, well, uh, I think uh, Braden has already done a wonderful introduction, so I'm not going <laughs> to spend more time on that. Um, I think both Gabby and I are quite interested in uh, finding ways to make more meaningful uh, research uh, about uh, open educational resources and uh, our network, that network that uh, we just studied together. So uh, it made sense for us to come up with a definition. Uh, very briefly, a definition of uh, what uh, we do with OER, and we have already talked uh, about this uh, in other presentations. I know that Giovanni, Emmy. Uh, had already talked about uh, what it means <laughs> to use uh, open educational resources. And in an upset, in an upshell, uh, materials for classroom use in the public domain and their open copyright licenses that are free of use, adaptations, and distribution. And there is a huge variety of ways to do it. And I think uh, the previous presentation was a great example of uh, how we can be creative about uh, open educational resources available, accessible for everyone. We can go uh, a little bit uh, deeper into the definition. There are different ways to approach it. Uh, there is a, a general one to, that was provided by UNESCO uh, in 2018. And I think what I'm going to focus here is in uh, touching upon some of the different ways that we can uh, think about open educational resources in terms of uh, learning content. It can be as big as a full course or even as a full program. Uh, it can be only the material, some modules, learning objects, collections, journals. There are many ways to think about it when we think about learning content. It can be also in a uh, in, in terms of tools, what is the software uh, that is supporting the creation, delivery, the use, and improvement uh, of open learning content? Um, and it can be also implementation of resources. It can be, uh, uh, for instance, those licenses, those property licenses that we are using to promote open publishing of materials. So many different ways to think about open educational resources. Another definition that is uh, uh, used in the field uh, is uh, this one that is adapted from the William and Flora uh, Foundation's definition. Those are free, available, and fully accessible instructional materials, right? And again, it includes uh, many different ways uh, of, uh, of educational resources. Um, I think in the end, our goal uh, in this network and the goal of uh, most people that are uh, participating actively or indirectly uh, with open educational resources 
is that we want uh, to uh, to work on uh, providing um, and improving a student's access and understand the potential that openly licensed and fully accessible materials have to help us increase affordability, access, and achievement for learners. As I said, in a nutshell, OER's goal is to increase access, affordability, and achievement for students. So framing our research in terms of uh, these definitions and this specific goal, I'm gonna let Gabby talk about uh, the review of the literature. Thank you very much. So uh, I, we have here three slides. So uh, to condense first the, the ideas on research in, in three different levels. First, there's research that talks about concerns and they were touched already by Giovanni and Emmy about the rising costs of textbooks. That's one of the main one of concerns right now and there's frustration. Now there are subtleties and doubts about measuring the quality of the OER textbooks. I mean, in general, the, these resources as compared to traditionally based produced by publishers. And then there is this concern about a learning factor, the student learning performance. So let's go now to the next, thank you, the next slide. So in terms of uh, student learning performance, there are three uh, results, three trends that the research has identified. There is a set of stu studies that find that uh, students taking classes where open educational resources are used tend to outperform their counterparts with traditional commercially based products. There is another set of studies that says, well, there are the students with using the OARs are doing less well. And then we have kind of the status quo uh, trend where there's no difference between um, commercially produced textbooks and OER textbooks as far as learning performance. But mind you, these studies have not measured the um, other factors such as learning, learner factors, motivation, um, learning strategies, the factor of who is the instructor, the type of course, the complexity of the course, the day uh, the class is taught. So for especially for number two and three, Let's take it with a grain of salt as well, okay? So, but overall, what has been uh, out there, what is out there in the literature? Overall, the, result, the results are positive. Uh, students perceive their experiences in courses with OERs uh, as positive. Um, the materials are considered of high quality. And yes, there is a big uh, applause for, uh, decreasing the cost uh, uh, the students incur in the, in the purchasing of the materials. Um, another factor, uh, another finding that was interesting is that the students tend to withdraw less and that they tend to have higher course grades and higher retention, which is the same as withdrawing in a certain way. But one of the reasons here given in the research is that the students now have a book available all the time. Some students enroll in courses where you have to purchase a book, but they never buy it, okay? So, uh, of course, they do very badly, right? So, uh, I think this, the way these external factors also interact with the variables are very important. So, yes, having a book always with you is a plus. So now we're gonna go to OER in K through 12 settings. And I will just start this and uh, the first the first one, yes. Um, and I will let um, Alejandro uh, explore a little more what we found. Um, OER in K through 12 setting is also a very ripe area of research and an opportunity also to reach out to the student population, especially in language courses where uh, uh, a language class is a requirement for university or college work. College, college work. So um, I was in another life, uh, a high school teacher teaching Spanish. And I remember my experiences having these books that were completely peeled with no pages, uh, ripped. 
and maintain over years and years from one generation to the next to teach languages. So the traditional books became obsolete. They never, uh, they have not stand to the evolution of the methodology, methodology, but also there is a budget constraint that schools cannot afford to keep up with books every two, three years and then buy the books for 200 students, right? So that is a flaw though of this situation. Um, also, the materials uh, are easily adapted and aligned with the standards when we have the flexibility of no cost and certainly virtual materials. Alejandro, I'll let you explore the rest. Thank you, Gabby. Yeah, um, so Gabby came up with uh, these findings and, uh, you know, these ideas about what is going on right now in the K-12 uh, context uh, for um, the use of textbooks and uh, other curricular materials. And I was also thinking about, uh, you know, the importance of, uh, I think I see here, yeah, about the importance of um, uh, the, developing this kind of uh, resources for K-12 as well, not only for higher education, because uh, one important thing that Gabby just mentioned is that uh, most uh, programs at the secondary level and uh, in some cases, uh, school districts are using a specific uh, standards, are developing a specific uh, curriculums uh, for their institutions. And uh, the sequence and the scope is very particular. The learning goals uh, that they select are very particular and sometimes are connected uh, with other content areas. So it's very hard for schools uh, to find good textbooks uh, that are well developed, designed, and that are gonna fit to the needs uh, of the school district, of the program, uh, etc. And something that can really have a huge impact is uh, trying to frame the way we develop resources for the K-12 uh, educational context based on these needs, on these challenges. Um, so that's uh, definitely an area that we would need to, to pay a, a special attention in the future when we do research and when we design new resources. I also like, uh, I also liked uh, all the presentations that we have uh, had uh, so far today but making the connection with the previous uh, presentation about the use of uh, social media, TikTok, uh, Instagram, and other, um, and other platforms is quite important. And again, I feel like uh, in some cases, the materials that uh, have been designed or that are being designed for higher education might not uh, be on the same page. So anyways, uh, these are just some important ideas that I think that we need to consider when we are doing both research and uh, designing new materials uh, for K-12. And I don't wanna go beyond the scope of the conversation. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna let uh, Gabby continue. And I believe this is the one that- uh... Yeah, well, we can already skip that one because um... Uh, one thing uh, that is also said by the teachers, and I think it was already mentioned, is really time consuming. Where do we find the resources? How do we create them? How do we align them with what we're doing? So there is this difficulty of locating, access I would say accessibility, and then adaptation. Uh, that is our two factors that need to be considered. We can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, this is just, resources. There are other resources, at least in Iowa, we have the uh, area education agencies, the AEAs, and they have uh, resources already set up for high school uh, with resources uh, for um, OERs. Also, we have OpenStack, and then uh, the University of Boy State University has a project where they already have a collection of activities, activity books for three languages, world languages, which is always called Let's Chat, I will let you go later to that. Uh, we can share this presentation with the group uh, if you wanna find the links and just find what there is. We can go to the, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I just added here, uh, I think Abby already 
did mention most of the important information that we wanted to, to share at this point. But I, I also wanted to mention that, so, well, in, in each institution, in, in each institution, um, probably in each state, you might be able to find uh, specific hubs, specific uh, places uh, where you have somehow organized uh, the resources uh, at the state level and perhaps at uh, the national level. Also, um, I'm just bringing up a couple of examples here. Uh, there are opportunities, uh, and I think it would be good uh, for all of us in this network to come together with uh, the different funding opportunities that we can bring. Uh, just for future collaboration and to make so, to make sense of uh, the different opportunities that we can bring. Uh, it's I think it's good that we are coming from different states because maybe we can, uh, you know, expand uh, the impact, but also uh, we can also attract funding from different places. Um, as Giovanni said at the beginning of, uh, of today's conference, what is uh, still missing is the access to resources that are well classified and were uh, labeled uh, in terms of pedagogy, methodology, in terms of uh, the languages that are taught, or even one area that uh, both Gabby and I uh, are very interested on is not only teaching languages, but also the methodology for teaching languages. So the methods of uh, world languages. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, is uh, still missing and it's uh, something that uh, we have uh, already mentioned and that we want to keep exploring how we can make it uh, stronger and uh, more accessible for, for everyone that want to use it. And, um, and well, this is uh, just an example of something that is happening at, uh, at uh, my institution. Uh, there are some initiatives um, that uh, well for this uh, for this year are not um, we are not going to be able to apply but uh, there are opportunities to apply here at the university of maryland i know uh, that uh, at the university of iowa we have been supported in the previous years uh, by different uh, sources uh, to fund uh, opportunities for developing oers so, you know, I think it's important that we all keep in mind that uh, for both for the design, the implementation and the research of uh, these materials, uh, we can trust and we should be uh, relying on uh, this type of funding. Yeah, and this is the elephant in the, in the living room, tenure and promotion for those that are on tenure track. And if you're not on a tenure track, I think this also is important because it would allow you to have your work valued. Um, I am in an institution that is teaching centered, but the OERs are something totally new. So uh, we do not have really rules or guidelines for tenure and promotion on how to work with this uh, type of material, the creation, the publication. So fortunately, our librarians at the regions here in Iowa have been very uh, active and they have created guidelines to help, help us to be advocates for um, the creation of content or these resources as really as a scholarship. And uh, something that we, I guess we need to advocate for. Um, I put those um, uh, links there for you to, to, to explore, but it's something that needs to be it needs to be considered scholarship as valuable as an article that is published in a, in a probably in a journal that nobody else will read except the expert. Here, the impact and the reach and the outreach to the bigger institutions, the students, and the impact on society and education, I think, far outweighs that little article that would be published in a journal that nobody else will read. So that is the advocacy. Uh, there are always opportunities to uh, seek professional development. Uh, the librarians probably would have sent you links to join uh, webinars. There's one upcoming and I put that there. I got it from my institution uh, uh, and it tackles what um, Giovanni uh, talked about first about the history of the, uh, of the textbook prices 
and, and their model. So uh, I think it's always important that we keep ourselves uh, ahead of the game, seeing what's out there. And probably these are topics that we have never looked because we're not really accountants. So keeping in, uh, in perspective other, other elements are external to teaching, but certainly affect us, I think is very important. So just questions at this point, Alejandro, anything else you want to add? I was just uh, wondering what is going to be the most uh, or the easiest way to uh, to share all the different links that we have provided in this presentation. Uh, I can copy and paste all of them in the chat, but maybe we can put them together in a in a document. Uh, well, the PowerPoint yeah. is already available on the Cadence website for the conference. So if you go to materials, you can download the full PowerPoint, yeah. and I can forward all the links if you want in two or three days when we upload the videos on YouTube. I can also share the links if you want to share them with me. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you. All right. Any comment or any comments or questions for Alejandro and Gabi? Oh, it looks like Christine has her hand raised. No, it's clapping. clapping. Oh, that's clapping. Okay. You're right. Hand raise is vertical, clapping is sideways. Gracias, yes, Cristina. <laughs> so I have a question. If in the in the kind of literature, in the literature review, there's a lot of the, the sense of comparison between the traditional, whatever that might be, material mm -hmm. <laughs> textbook and an OER platform, right? And I wonder like the kind of risk of comparison that this is just transferring from one media, one medium to another, rather than what I see a lot of the work and the small glimpses of the work that you are doing is uh, the invitation of OER to be innovative in methodology. And I was wondering about like that openness and that kind of like how the format of an OER and the format of this kind of the, this way of, of creating content of the classroom, how that can go beyond um, these other textbooks in a, in a kind of radically different way. And if you could speak a little bit to, to that. I don't have much information about that. They know in nobody, but I did not find that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been a scheme, but I have not looked to the detail of finding if the methodology makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, and I think also it's because what the research shows, they, I said they miss the other variables. Yeah. They just take numbers, right? They're going to do a, statist a statistical analysis for learning performance, right? Mm -hmm. So they're not looking at the other factors that it would, this would be design, you know, learning aspects. So that would be something else to look at. Yes, it would make a difference. Yeah. Danielle? Hi, thank you so much for that. And, and I'm really interested in all of the aspects that you've talked about. And, and specifically now, one thing that we've been discussing with our libraries and maybe um, either can comment and maybe in your experience from being upper level administration, how do we advocate for this type of creation to go towards promotion? Because right now it doesn't. So for me, uh, I'm in teaching stream, but textbook creation doesn't go towards my promotion, which is, I mean, I'm at an R1 institution, so it takes a lot of advocacy. And I wonder if there are some practical means you know, by which you would recommend doing this at what level, who has to really like, you know, I'm a lecturer. So then is it that would you recommend to my chair or do I have to dean or am I looking at provost or, you know, this type of advocacy is going to take a long time, but I wonder what your, your quick and easy recommendation would be of how to start. Well, I'm like you, I, I plan to go, I'm an associate professor. Uh, and yes, uh, although I'm, I'm not super up in upper administration, I always say that I'm just just person that helps. OK, um, um, I think it starts at the departmental level. It has to start with you need to build a team of your of your people. Yeah. Your voice will not count on its own. So your own people needs to be on board with this. Uh, there has to be a process through which the material will be reviewed. Right. Sort of peer review. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, 
Pearson, you know, evaluators, you know, it has to be your colleagues. And then, yes, it will have to be written in some way in guidelines in, at the departmental level. They can be very broad so that you can insert. Uh, and then, yes, librarians are the best resource. Uh, they have all the information on data on how on the impact. They really, they've done this tremendously well. So I can share some of the documents um, with you, but I know that they have put some links, but I'll be happy to. Uh, in fact, there is a whole set of guidelines, and I think it's one of the ones I put on how to present an OER as a publication for tenure and promotion. And I think the key here, the key element is really to talk about the impact um, and how this will benefit student success, not just that is a cost savings measure, but mm -hmm. how this reaches out uh, to the student development. That is really broad. I hope it helps. No, no, that's really great. And it's my instinct, but it, I know it takes a long time. So it's just knowing that, okay. I wonder if any folks have reached out or they connected with their DEI office, if this is some area that anyone has tried to connect with over this, like in terms of social justice, in terms of these issues? Yeah, the only three thing that I see with, at least in my institution, the I does not work with curriculum. And That's academic, yeah. Curriculum. Yeah. But it's not, it's not that it's not worth reaching out. Sure. It's worth to find advocates. Right. Probably the advocacy would be how this supports students that are, that don't have the means to purchase. Right. the materials and, and the impact this creates. Mm -hmm. Now, I think what is important would be also for students like uh, universities like numbers. So how this can be a tool for retention yeah. and recruitment in the programs. Mm -hmm. So that is the other aspect that probably this needs to be explored. That's really helpful. Thank you. Gracias. Claudia. Uh, hi. Uh, we are three uh, faculty members here from the Louis from Louisiana State University. We are very early in the process, but one of the objectives that we have using uh, OER is accessibility for the students that do not have the resources for textbooks, even then electronic uh, services that they could use, then are so expensive. The, the membership, even if they are going to use it in two semesters, is still very expensive. And the rest of students then are, uh, might drop the class or have dropped the class because they just do not have the money to purchase the textbook. And that is, if we are going to work a student center and that is what we advocate for, we have to create the conditions and the space for the students to be able to have that opportunity. So that's one of the goals, but we are very early in the stage. Um, we have the support of our chair, but we're just starting to work on this. And, and it's been very helpful, the information and the experiences that you have shared with us today. Christine also has a hands up. Go ahead, Christine. I think um, the observation someone made that so many times students do not buy the textbook. And I think being able to document the percentage of students who never buy the textbook for a certain level or kind of class, presenting that to a student success committee or the equivalent we have on this, on University of Iowa campus, we have a very active and very well-run student success committee to present to them information about how often students are not buying the textbook and saying that OER resources will be a contribution to student success because they would have access to the textbook. And then you don't have to argue that it's this population of students or that population, um, you need only say, we have data that say students don't buy the textbook. 
and therefore they don't do their homework. Therefore, they can't succeed in the course. Um, I think that would be very convincing. Um, that's one point I would make. Another point I would make is in terms of tenure and promotion, um, this is not an issue that started with OER. This is a problem that language pedagogy has always had um, in, in the status hierarchy of language learning and in, in the status hierarchy of language department. So um, I would look to the, the in the pedagogy area and ask how they got their pedagogy work recognized for tenure and promotion and say, really, that's the contribution, whether it's OER or traditional textbooks. Thank you all so much. This has really been wonderful. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. All right, any last comments before we take our lunch break? I just want to add one more thing about the tenure and promotion. Please do. Ask. So just, um, I, I don't remember the, the lady that asked me about Daniel. tenure and promotion. Daniel. Daniel. So, um, one thing that we're doing at our institution, our librarians, as I said, the librarians in the three institutions in Iowa, state institutions, have really taken the lead. So we have now um, a librarian heading a task force to invite faculty to join the OER network and start working on including uh, materials and designing materials uh, for the university I work at, University of Northern Iowa and try to um, create um, a conscience of how we can develop this further. And this is also supported now by the provost office. So somebody asked me where to go. Yes, library and provost, and then reaching out to different, different faculty leaders uh, to start the conversation, really. Um, writing a textbook is a big deal, and it takes time. So uh, one of the things that is being discussed is how I'm going to be relieved of some of my work to do this work, right? So these are the conversations that need to happen, but yes, there I'm lucky that is we have a provost that is supportive and trying to get more people on, on board. And yes, another one thing for tenure and promotion. I am in a literature department where I was told that Oh, if you have more than two authors, then we don't look good at it. So uh, pedagogy and applied linguistics, most of the articles have more than one author because they're huge, huge research studies. Just to collect the data is a mega thing. So it's, there are materials out of the MLA that attest to these difficulties and really advocate for getting rid of these free notions that are really not evidence-based. So just, just that was the last thought that I wanted to share. Yeah, and one thing, so one thing we did at Tayoa with the, with the librarian of Iowa, we created a PowerPoint. They created a main website with all these resources, but we created a PowerPoint that I personally shared with all the DEO of the Division of World Language and Classics. Other faculty shared with other chairs of their departments. We are planning on sharing this PowerPoint to the faculty saying and so it's like you're just like taking your initiative and like try to share with people in charge of your university just to make them aware of OER, the time constraint that it takes to develop those resources, the study behind it, the research behind it. So for example, for one textbook, we had more than like 10 or 12 reviewers from various universities. So the quality of those materials is like it's all peer reviewed, even if it doesn't have a traditional publisher that maybe doesn't even do that much peer review yeah. because they, they will just pay someone to do it while we asked to many faculty to do it for free and they all volunteered their time and we had all those research all those review the textbook was piloted in one class then we did a study to see how students were using it if they if it was well received by the students or not so there is like a lot of work behind it. So we just need to educate everyone in our faculty, in our university so that they are aware of it. 
And I mean, for tenure and promotion, I mean, there's like service to the discipline, service to the department, service across the university. And I think it's some of these kind of community, like uh, grassroots community that's being built around OER gets formalized accounts of service to. We wanted more than service. Yeah, no, no, I understand that, but <laughs> I think that the, but the details that you're saying are they're going to take a long time to get you do they get the kind of recognition and the changing tenure promotion and the details around that for digital scholarship, which has been around for a really long yeah. time is taking so long, but frustratingly slow and the multi author thing, which I mean the humanities is moving towards as it becomes more innovative. Um, even within like li literature department. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really frustrating how slow it's taking. And so for me, I'm trying to think of like, there's got to be like creative ways to like make this work count. Sure. Yeah. Right. And make some of the above and beyond, if you want to call it that, things that we're doing in the classroom to have better engagement with students that are like changing so much now, how they're learning. And we're trying, we're doing like what we're trying to do is to try to keep up with how much they're changing and the methods that they're learning. Um, and so just like trying to, I'm trying to figure out ways, you know, uh, as I'm kind of creating new content for courses, like how that can count or while I wait for these other systems to take hold in the slow way that they do in administration. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Yeah, so what we'll be doing for the back half 